thank the college and the uh, Southwestern Surgical Congress for, um, uh, for uh, allowing me to give this talk. Um, especially like to thank the Southwestern because uh, as you'll see as I go through this presentation, several of these papers have been presented here and published in the American Journal of Surgery uh, uh, regarding uh, rural surgery. So this, this organization has had uh, a, a effect on some of the things that is certainly what we've done in our program. Um, would I just press this? Yeah. Okay, so I don't have any financial disclosure or anything. Uh, maybe I wish I did, but I don't. But um, I, the only things I like to say is I'm not a rural surgeon. I'm a surgical oncologist. I work in Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, but I live in a rural state, um, North Dakota. I speak with rural surgeons almost on a daily basis. They refer patients to me all the time. Um, as a chairman of the uh, Department of Surgery at the University of North Dakota, mo a good portion of my faculty, uh, my clinical faculty, are, ru are rural surgeons around the state, not just general surgeons, but uh, orthop orthopods and you know, all of the different subspecialties. Um, as it's been referred to before in this meeting, our program is very well known for training rural surgeons, and, uh, and we have, uh, at last count, a little over 40% of all of our uh, previous graduates are, are in rural practices at the present time. And probably most importantly, my state, our state legislature, is very interested in training rural physicians, uh, which has been uh, the way, the, 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 one of the ways that we've gotten a lot of funding through our state legislature. We're, you know, we're fortunate in North Dakota that we, we have oil in our state and we have, uh, where they actually have a lot of money, uh, and actually have a budget surplus every year, and we've been able to get some of that money to use in as far as expanding our medical school and our residency programs. Um, so what I'm going to try to do here is talk a little bit about the scope of the problem. Uh, Tyler's already covered some of this. Uh, what we've done to assess the problem, uh, how, uh, how, how we feel the adequacy of current training for rural surgery, some of the different rural surgery training models, and then just finally take a look at our, uh, at our model. So this is a map uh, that uh, you, may, you may have seen before, but this is, uh, this is America as, uh, by population density, and you know, the dark blue is where all the heavy populations are, and as you'll see, most of the Midwest and, and other areas of the country are, are, are fairly rural. Uh, up in North Dakota, where we are, does this have a pointer? Oh, jeez. All right, forget it. I won't point. Anyway, 12 o'clock. Oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. Oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, anyway, so, um, so as you can see, uh, uh, most of the center, the, the center in the Midwest part of the country uh, is, uh, is very rural and uh, in uh, other isolated areas around the country. Um, so just uh, some of the things that, uh, that Tyler didn't mention, uh, most rural hospitals, the general surgeon is, a, is really a critical part of the hospital. 30 to 40 percent of the revenue comes from the surgical practice. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, there's uh, short and long-term shortages of surgeons in, in rural communities. Uh, predicted by 2020 to be a shortage of 1,875 general surgeons and a good portion of those in the rural areas. And as Tyler mentioned, the average age is over 50. Uh, rural, uh, surgery, general surgery is actually the second highest predicted shortage uh, behind primary care uh, in, in, in when they look at future projections for physicians. Now these are, the, these are some of the issues in rural surgery. I mean, there's a long list here. And I, I'd like to be able to tell you that we've solved all these problems, but uh, I, I think I'd be lying if I did that. Um, what we've tried to do is, uh, is look at uh, some of the area, some of the things that, uh, that we could actually address and that look at, you know, things like the workforce, recruitment and retention, and lack of broad-based training. Um, so the, this, is, this is sort of a summarization of the problem. Rural surgery workforce is inadequate uh, with predictions for uh, the future that are worse. Uh, I think anybody in a rural uh, setting knows that recruitment of general surgeons to rural areas is often difficult, and, and many people feel that the training of rural surgeons in general surgery programs is inadequate. So 
when I first came to North Dakota in 2003, um, you know, we, as a rural state and as a rural, uh, as a program that, that was known for rural training, I started to look and try to figure out what was the actual situation in rural surgery. And I was pretty surprised to find out that there really wasn't a lot in the literature. There were a few studies that looked at things, uh, that, that looked at, uh, compared uh, different kinds of practices and so forth. But in, uh, in, uh, in many of those cases, they were based on second and third hand data and really didn't give a really accurate picture of what a rural surgeon does. I think the one thing that they all that they all concluded was that rural and urban case mixes were, or, were significantly different. But it was really hard to tell from them because they didn't, they didn't really look at an all-inclusive picture of what a rural surgeon does. So what we did is uh, we started this in 2006. Um, we, went, we, we decided to do a study on the uh, rural surgeons in North and South Dakota. We went to the medical boards, we looked at all the licensed general surgeons, we, we used the RUCA codes uh, to identify the people in the rural practices, and then we contacted each of them and uh, did a lifestyle and practice pattern survey. And Joel Harris, who's, uh, who's a member of this, uh, in, in the audience, they did a lot of this work. <coughs> the other thing that we did, was, which was relatively unique, was instead of using databases to look at their practice, we actually got the CPT data of all of the procedures that they did in the, in the 2006 year. And um, so we, and, and it, w it was surprising what the cooperation was. We had, uh, you know, over 80% of the people in the study uh, actually participated and they had their office managers give us all of their CPT data from, from, that, uh, from that calendar year. So, and, and this is just the, the, rural, the, the RUCA codes are based on population uh, density. Large rural is uh, up to 50,000, small is 2,500 to 10,000, and isolated is less than 2,500. Um, so the, the, the surgeons that we included were uh, people that were in a general surgery practice that were, uh, had been in that, practice, in that location for greater than 12 months. They had to have at least 50 cases per year. We found a few surgeons that were really more uh, uh, primary care than, than, than doing any surgery. And they had to have their case records available to be, uh, to be uh, in this part of the study. And this is, this is what we came up with. Um, we had uh, a total of, we identified a total of 58 actually in one additional, so 59 surgeons. Six uh, were no longer, either didn't qualify or uh, had moved. That left us 53. Four said they wouldn't participate. Five said they couldn't get us their data. So we had 43 out of 53, which is about 81% of the surgeons that participated. Just a brief summarization of the demographic uh, data. Um, there, 57% uh, of the surgeons were over 50 years old. 92% were male. Most of them came from a small town, a smaller town, 70% less than a town of less than 50,000, and a third of them less than a town of less than 10,000. 63% um, were, were in private practice, and 77% were either, either solo or in a two-surgeon group. The hospital size was less than 40, uh, 40 beds for uh, over 50% of, the, of them. Many of them either didn't have an ICU or had an ICU with less than five beds. And uh, as you can imagine, they worked a lot of hours, 43% uh, uh, over 60 hours per week, and almost all of them worked over 40 hours per week. So what I want, what I, what I want to concentrate on here is the, the, uh, is the CPT uh, results. We call this the Dakota Database for Rural Surgery. When we took all of the procedures that the um, surgeons gave us, we had over 46,000 procedures from 43 different surgeons. There were 87% of them, or 88% of them were uh, general surgical procedures, and 12.3% were, um, were special, uh, specialty surgery procedures, and I'll go into that in a lot more detail. In general, uh, the surgeons did a lot of cases every year. The smaller uh, rural ones, which are the, anybody in a town less than 10,000, they did o uh, over 1,300 cases per year. And the larger rural did almost 1,000 for an average of 1,071. Now remember, this does include all types of surgery, including minor surgical procedures and endoscopies, which in many of the previous studies have not been uh, included. 
So what we did to analyze this data is we used what they call the CCS codes. This is a, a coding uh, classification software that was uh, developed by the federal government. And this, this uh, groups all of the uh, thousands of different CPT and ICD-9 codes into 244 uh, categories that, that are, uh, you know, similar, similar categories. And I'll just briefly run through this. But so, uh, you know, these are the CCS codes that we use for each of these different categories to, to, to categorize the types of surgery. Uh, and then in the uh, specialty, in the subspecialty cases, there were certain uh, CCS codes that fit into each of these, uh, each of these categories. So our first paper that we, uh, that we presented here, I think it was in 2009, uh, Joel uh, presented this. And uh, that looked at the overview of, of, the, uh, of the procedures. And this data was a, a, a somewhat, it, it confirmed some of the previous studies, but it also was somewhat interesting because we had, you know, more of a, a more complete data set. So we found that, as others, we found that endoscopy was a very significant portion of a rural surgeon's practice. Uh, about, uh, overall, 39.8%. For smaller surgeons, of a little higher, 41.7, and for large rural surgeons, uh, a little less. What we also found is that their, uh, the, the minor surgical procedures that they did were a significant part uh, in, um, that was a, a total of about 18% of their total practice, 23% uh, for, for the small rural, and 15% for the large rural. And their subspecialty procedures, these are all the uh, things that normally you don't see in a general surgical uh, uh, residency or practice, were actually 12.3% of their procedures, a little higher in the, in the small rural and a little less in the, uh, in the large rural. Um, so w the next thing we wanted to look at was the, the, w what they did in the subspecialty areas because that way we felt that was a significant portion of their practice. And what we found was that uh, their, the, the leading ones that were categorized in the subspecialty areas was vascular surgery, which is 37.5. Again, this was much higher in the large rural areas than in the small rural areas, and you could probably understand why. Uh, OBGYN was next at 18%, or almost 19%. This, interestingly, was... Um, was much higher in the small rural areas than the large rural areas. Uh, orthopedics was 15. Uh, that's uh, more, uh, again, more prevalent in the small rural areas. Uh, cardiothoracic, 11 percent, uh, fairly even between small and large rural. And urology was 9 percent, and um, again, fairly, uh, fairly close in the small and large rural. Um, the other thing I wanted to do was look at um, the, uh, if you excluded endoscopy, what percentage of a rural surgeon's practice was in specialty procedures? And so if you, if you, if you look at it for the percent of total, it's 12.3 percent. But when you, when you take out the endoscopy cases, which are about, uh, oh, close to 20,000 cases, the, um, the percent of non-endoscopy cases that a rural surgeon did is almost one-fifth of their practice, as, a, as a, actually is a little more than one-fifth of their practice. So the next thing that we did, and this was presented last year at this meeting and published also in the, in the American Journal of Surgery, was look at the subspecialty uh, uh, procedures. And, and the reason, of course, for doing this is that we were in the process of developing this rural surgery tract and we wanted to know what, the, what kind of things that we needed to train our, our people in when they're going out into small practices. So, um, and this, this is an example. We did this for all of the subspecialty areas, but we did this for example, and what we did is we took those CCS codes and we looked at the actual CPT uh, codes for the procedures that were done. And what we, you know, and, and so this is in OBGYN. What we found was that, uh, you know, C-sections and hysterectomies were a significant part, tubal ligations uh, and, 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 and placenta deliveries and so forth. These were all the things that all the, the, the OBGYN uh, code, CPT codes that our rural surgeons in North and South Dakota were using. Uh, so what we found is that uh, in this subspecialty, uh, C-sections were the highest, 24 percent, 
Hysterectomies accounted for 15 percent, and tubal ligations are 13 percent. So, so for us, if we were going to train a, somebody to go out into a rural practice, we would have probably want them to be familiar with these procedures because they're going to be, they're going to, at least in our in our area of the country, they're probably going to be asked to do these kinds of procedures. So th this is sort of a summary of what we found. Rural surgeons have higher volumes. Endoscopy, minor surgery, and subspecialty make up a good portion of the practice. Subspecialty procedures make up almost 20% uh, of uh, uh, non-endoscopic cases. And our conclusion was that, uh, and I think a lot of people would confirm this, that rural surgeons' skill set is different from urban surgeons. I don't think you're going to find many urban surgeons doing C-sections and tubal ligations and all of the other kinds of things that we did in the other subspecialties. Um, you know, I, we, we did analyze for all of the other subspecialties. I don't have time to go through all of that, but uh, the, the, the results were, were similar. So the next thing we wanted to do is evaluate whether or not our current training programs actually train residents adequately for a rural surgery practice. And this was a little bit difficult to do, but one of the things that we, we used was the SCORE curriculum. And as you know, the SCORE curriculum um, uh, divides, the, um, di divides all of the surgical procedures into three different categories, essential common, essential uncommon, and complex. And the essential common and the essential uncommon are procedures that they feel general surgery residents should be able to do. The common, of course, is the largest category. That includes things, you know, from hernias, gallbladders, and so forth. The uncommon are bigger procedures that you don't do quite as often, but they still feel you know how to do them. The complex are the ones that are, that, that, that in many cases, they, they feel that the general surgery residents should, should be aware of them, know, 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 what, know the uh, pathophysiology, but they don't really know, have to know how to do those procedures, such as a, you know, Whipple or liver resection or, or some of those bigger procedures. So what we did is we then matched up the top three procedures from the CPT code analysis with the, um, with the SCORE curriculum. And what we found is that in vascular surgery, our top, three co our top three procedures were central line insertions, removal of ports or central lines, and, and vein ablations. And all three of these things were covered, uh, are, are required in the SCORE curriculum. So we felt, you know, really do they ne need extra training in vascular? Probably not. Cardiothoracic was very similar, okay? Uh, chest tube and, and bronchoscopies were the highest numbers of procedures. And um, do they need, um, do they need, a, 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 and pacemakers was the other one. Do they really need additional training in cardiothoracic? Probably not. The, um, the next area, the, 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 uh, we looked at the other four areas, OBGYN, ortho, urology, and otolaryngology, and in these ones, most of the major procedures were actually not covered in a general surgery curriculum, okay? So you can see C-sections, hysterectomy is actually in there, tubal ligations, no, uh, arthrocentesis, ganglions, vasectomies, circumcisions, uh, and all these things are not actually covered in the general surgery curriculum. So, to answer the question, is current general surgery training adequate for rural surgery? You know, a lot depends on where the, the uh, resident is, go is going to be going into practice and what he's going to be expected to do. But in general, our, our, uh, our evaluation said no because they're not getting training in a lot of these different areas. Um, so, what is, from, from, so, so the next thing, now that we had the data and we knew how to um, how to do this, the next thing was what do we need to, um, to actually develop a rural surgery training program? Well, obviously the first thing is a, uh, access to rural rotations. Uh, they need to have access to subspecialty cases, which can be an issue in some of the larger uh, university programs where they have subspecialty uh, residents training in all those areas, and there may be some, uh, some friction. Uh, they should, we feel they should get some additional endoscopy training. Our program is pretty strong in endoscopy to start with, but we still feel they should get some additional one. A, they obviously need a rural faculty willing to teach. We've been fortunate to have that in our, our, our area. And then, we, then you also have the ability, you also have to have the ability to incorporate some of these rural rotations in your training program. And, you know, with the 80-hour work week and all of the other things that have gone on in general surgical training, if you don't have the ability to uh, add a few additional rotations, 
you're going to you're going to be in trouble because you you won't be able to cover your other services as a as a program director. Um, so, last thing I want to talk about is the is the training models. Um, it, there are basically two different ways that people have approached training uh, individuals for rural surgery practices. One is to try to incorporate it in a five-year program, and there are a number of programs around the country that have rotations in rural uh, settings for their residents. And they vary. Most places, it's one or two months, maybe three months. Uh, but the, you know, the other, the other end of that spectrum is the University of Oregon, Karen Devaney's program where they, they send somebody out for 12 months uh, to, a, uh, to a rural location. Uh, in some situations, there's some flexi enough flexibility to allow uh, a, a program to tailor some subspecialty rotations to practice expectations for somebody that's graduating from the program i.e. if they're going to go out somewhere and they need to uh, know how to do C-sections, they can put them with the OBGYN or so for a month or so. And then, and then ours is the, uh, and our approach has been the rural surgery track. The other option is to do additional training uh, in which, uh, with a fellowship <coughs> tailored to the practice expectations. That's what they do in Cooperstown at the Bassett Healthcare where they uh, do a three to six month fellowship and uh, if, they, if they need urology or OBGYN, they'll incorporate that. And lastly, is the, is the newest thing, is the transition, transition, transitions into practice fellowship that the college is developing, and that's something that's just starting this year. And I'll just quickly go through this, because I know I'm already over time here, Tyler, but uh, you, you are a little short, so I, I, I'll, I'll take up your extra time. Um, the, um, the, so our program, uh, you know, as I mentioned, we've had a long history of training people, 40% of our graduates. We have, I think what we have is a very good setting for it. We're a rural state. state. We have no other surgical trainees, and we have uh, uh, you know, almost unlimited access to subspecialty cases where our residents are. We also have the Institute for Rural Medicine at our medical school, and of course, we, we developed this rural surgery track. This is our rural surgery track. We uh, formally implemented this in, in 2009. Uh, actually, our first rural surgery resident is here, and she's sitting in the back of the room there. Uh, and uh, and uh, we we you know this is limited to people that really have uh, a commitment to practice in a rural uh, location. Um, we this just this past year we actually listed two separate tracks in our program. We we expanded our program to four about a year uh, two years ago, and so this year we listed a, two of our uh, residents as in the categorical general surgery track and two in the, um, in the rural surgery, rural surgery uh, categorical tract. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was actually an interesting experience. I'll show you some data on that in one second. These are the rotations that we do, and these are b and almost entirely based on the study that we did. We have three rural surgery. We actually have a mission thing where we, uh, we send them to Haiti or in, and looking at other places. There's two OB, one ortho, one ENT, one urology, and then we do an additional month in endoscopy. And that basically reinforces the areas that we found in our studies th that needed uh, additional, uh, where, where rural people needed additional training. So um, these are some of the barriers. Recognition of rural surgery is, I think that's really not a barrier anymore. Over the last five years, it's been certainly been recognized. Uh, if you have subspecialty trainees where you are, they, you, your res, you, you, you may have your residents uh, competing. Endoscopy training can be a barrier. Uh, you know, I think we're all familiar with the, with the, uh, uh, the gastroenterologist statement a year and a half ago, and, and that's, I think that's been passed. But uh, 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 rural surgeons actually do a lot of endoscopy, and they, they have a, they're a good uh, resource for that. We need a faculty willing to teach. Uh, it's been surprising that I, in some of the subspecialty areas, I've had a, sometime, in some situations had a difficult time getting faculty to teach rural surgery residents the basics of, of their specialty. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, it's hard for me to put somebody um, on an orthopedic rotation with a guy that's just doing knees or hips. That's not what I need a rural surgeon or surgery resident to, to, uh, to know. I need them to know how to, you know, assess initial orthopedic injuries, know what they can take care of and what they can't and so forth. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, you need to have the ability, uh, the flexibility in your program to add these rotations. Um, is there an interest in rural surgery? This is the last thing I'll, I'll talk about. Oh. 
Um, in uh, this year's match, uh, we had 410 applicants for our four positions. About 55% of all our applicants uh, uh, applied for the rural surgery track. So that was over 200 applicants for those two positions. So I, 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 would, say, I would have to say that there is a significant interest among medical students in, um, in, uh, in rural surgery. Uh, can a rural surgeon be trained in a five-year program? Uh, yes, I think it's possible if the appropriate conditions exist. If, if the appropriate conditions in the, um, in the institution do not exist, then uh, other alternatives like the fellowship program, I think, are, are the thing to do. Uh, just a uh, uh, recognition, Joel, who's in the audience, he did a lot of the work for that uh, data. Brady was another resident that did uh, some of that work, and Clint was our statistician that did all the analysis. So, sorry I went over, but, uh, but uh, uh, I just wanted to give you a full view.